Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about airfoils and wings. We'll get about halfway through and then continue next time. Let's first just define some basic nomenclature for an airfoil. This black curve here is an airfoil. If you took a wing and you chopped a cross section of it, this would be an airfoil shape. Uh, the front part is called the leading edge. And the backmost part is called the trailing edge. And if I take a straight line from the leading edge to the trailing edge, that's this blue line, the lower blue line here, that's called the cord line. And its length is the cord, that's a frequent length we'll use. Okay, this other blue line, this is called the camber line. Okay, so whereas the cord line was from leading edge to trailing edge, just straight line, a camber line is halfway between the upper and lower surface, right? So here's that upper, here's that lower surface. Halfway between them is called the camber line. And the distance, let's say it's about right here, this is called the maximum camber or sometimes just camber for short. Uh, if we go between the upper and lower surface, say here to here, this would be the maximum thickness of the airfoil or sometimes just thickness for short. So if I say an airfoil is 12% thick, that means that uh, this distance here divided by the cord length is 12%, right? So we'd often write it like this way, T over C equals 0 0.12. T is the thickness, C is the cord length. And so this would be a 12% thick airfoil. Airfoils are gonna fall within a relatively narrow range for aircraft. You know, a thin airfoil would be about maybe 8%. A thick airfoil would be, say, 14% or so. Um, for wind turbines, they can get thicker. You know, they may be 20, 30% or so sometimes. As we move towards the route, then it becomes a cylinder. So, so it really varies, but for aircraft, we're usually in a relatively narrow range. And for like a rocket fin or supersonic aircraft, they may be much thinner, you know, so 4% or something. Um, the, uh, another point that we're going to use uh, is called the quarter cord line or quarter cord point. So the cord length again is this distance from front to back. The quarter cord is just one fourth of the way back from the leading edge. So that's, that's a point that's important in aerodynamics and it's something we'll, we'll use a few times. But these are sort of the basic parameters of an, of an airfoil. Uh, as you've learned in fluid mechanics, there are two, uh, all the forces and moments that are, are on an airfoil or any fluid, any body in a fluid, come from two sources. One is pressure, and that's what we're seeing up here, P pressure, and the other is shear stresses, okay? So those are the only two mechanisms, and if we take all the pressure and all the shear stress and integrate it around the body, then we get resultant forces and moments. It's very important, and we'll get more into this as we start talking about drag, to kind of understand the differences between uh, how a shape affects pressure versus shear stress. There are often significant trade-offs, especially in drag, uh, that will occur between pressure and shear stress, and, and we'll get more into that. But for now, we have pressure, shear stress. We take all of these distributed uh, stresses and integrate them over the body, and we will get resultant forces and moments. So I've drawn a little airfoil here. Um, this V infinity means free stream. Infinity is just a V infinity is just a common way to designate the free stream. Um, so you could think of it two ways. One, you could think of it from the reference point of the airfoil. It's fixed, not moving. And the air wind is coming at it. So the wind is coming from below and it's kind of coming around. Another way you could think about it maybe more natural. This is the exact same shape, but we've just rotated it up here in this box here. Uh, you could think of it as the airfoil is moving 
right? So the air is still, or, or I guess, first of all, let's just say you could think of this as this is the exact same system. We just rotate it. We can rotate it any way we want. Sometimes it's convenient to have the free stream be horizontal. Sometimes it's convenient to have the body be horizontal. They're equivalent. But the, again, the two ways you could think of the system is body fixed, free stream coming in. Another is air is fixed, body is moving through it. Um, if you were looking at an airplane, of course, we usually think of the latter, and that's physically, you know, from, from our inertial frame, somewhat inertial frame. As we look at an airplane, that's what we, we see, right? Still air, airplane moves through it. But from an aerodynamics point of view, it's more convenient to think of the body as fixed, going to the body frame, and think of the air moving around it. That's the way we think of things in a wind tunnel. That's the way we think of things in analysis. Um, it's just easier to, to work through. So uh, the question I want to pose for you, though, this is the free stream. So this is the way the air is coming in. I've drawn four arrows here. And I want you to label which one you think is lift. And if you've done that, label which one you think is drag. So just pause, take 20 seconds here. Label one vector as lift and another as drag. Okay, sometimes uh, we might think that this one is lift because it's pointing up and I intentionally drew it this way just so that we can be clearer here. Actually, this is the lift vector and this is the drag vector. And we use L for lift, D for drag. Why is that? Well, drag is always in the direction of the free stream by definition. So if my free stream vector is pointing this way, the resultant of all that pressure and shear stress, the resultant force that is in this direction is defined as drag. Lift is always perpendicular to the free stream. Okay, so by definition, this will be the left or the lift. If we were looking at this picture here, right? So lift would be this way, drag would be this way in perpendicular and parallel to the free stream velocity. Um, we can, of course, resolve forces and moments in any coordinate system we want. This is the one we typically use as aerodynamicists. Another common one is to reference things relative to this chord line here or a, a reference line for the geometry. And then we would call this say, the normal force, N for normal, and A, the axial force. Again, we can use any coordinate system, but these are the two most convenient. We'll often have a, we'll also have a pitching moment. Um, for an airfoil, in general, there's going to be three moments, but for an airfoil, this is just a 2D section, so there's just one moment. Um, pitching moment is going to cause it, and, and by convention, we'll say a positive pitching moment is one that's going to cause the airfoil to nose up, the aircraft to nose up, so that would be a positive pitching moment. Okay, so as aerodynamicists or as fluid mechanics folks, we, we really like to use non-dimensional numbers. This is pervasive through lots of engineering, not just fluid mechanics. And you've discussed this a bit in your introductory fluids course, and we'll discuss it again several times. Uh, but briefly, one reason for this, there are many, one reason is that this allows us to define quantities that are broadly useful, that they, uh, um, vary across a narrow scale across a wide range of geometry. So let me let me show you what I mean first. Let's first define one quantity and it's and it's called the dynamic pressure it's given the symbol Q and it's one half rho V infinity squared. You will have seen this again in introductory class. I'm not sure if you used a Q or not but this is common for nemesis. Okay, this is called the dynamic pressure. It's one half times the density times the free stream velocity squared. So with that, we're going to define a non-dimensional lift. So we, we talked about what the lift force was, but lift force itself is not as useful, usually, as a non-dimensional version of the lift force. So we'll call this the lift coefficient. And it's defined like so, okay? This is called the lift coefficient. And there are a few things to note here. One is I used um, a lowercase c and a lowercase l. That's the convention for airfoils because it's in 2D. We'll see later for wings 
for airplanes, which are 3D, we'll use capital letters, but for 2D, we use lowercase letters. Q is the dynamic pressure, C is the cord, L is the lift. I, I used a prime because it's actually a force per unit length because again, this is an airfoil, so it's 2D. So we're really just looking at a cross section. So it's a force per unit depth, if you will, into the page if you're thinking about it that way. Okay, so lift coefficient is useful because whether I'm a dragonfly or I'm a 747 large transport aircraft, my lift coefficient is going to fall across a relatively narrow range. Um, without some sort of augmentation, it's not going to be much higher than, say, 1.5 ish. Uh, you know, again, without some special devices. Um, that's going to stall. It's going to generally be when I'm flying somewhere in the range of say 0.2 to 1 or so. That's a very typical range. So it's, it's a non-dimensionalization. Whereas if I was talking about the lift force, you know, these can vary across orders of magnitude depending on the size of my plane. So if I tell you a lift coefficient, I automatically know, oh, that's a high lift coefficient or that's a really low one. Whereas if I say a lift force, it doesn't mean anything without some additional context. Um, it also is, of course, used in dynamic similarities as kind of the basis of wind tunnel testing that I can uh, test, say, a large vehicle with similar, with uh, the same non-dimensional numbers in, say, a wind tunnel, and I can predict the lift coefficients. The lift and drag won't be the same, but I can get the same lift coefficients and drag coefficients, which then allow me to predict lift and drag at, at the full scale size. So non-dimensional numbers are very important. We're also going to define uh, what's called the drag coefficient. Okay, very similar definition only except for we use the drag force per unit length. It's called the drag coefficient. Um, and the last one is the pitching moment coefficient. That's this moment. And a moment is a force times a length, right? So we've got an extra length that we need to have in the denominator to normalize this. So it'll be a chord squared. And this is called the pitching moment coefficient. Okay, and so these are uh, terms we'll use quite frequently. And when we get to wings, we'll have some additional ones similar, but uh, uh, we'll have a few more in 3D. Okay, so let's introduce one more uh, non-dimensional parameter, and this is called the pressure coefficient. Okay, and I'm going to introduce this in the context of a cylinder before I define it. Let's just think about a cylinder here. So on the left, we've got a visualization of the flow around a cylinder. Again, this is just a 2D geometry. Um, we're going to work this towards an airfoil, so you could think about this as a really lousy airfoil for the moment. Um, in white, you see the streamlines, right? So the flow comes up and around, oops, up and around the cylinder. The colors correspond to the pressure. So in this uh, color choice, this dark blue is a high pressure, and this white is a low pressure. Okay, so as you can imagine there's a stagnation point here, very high pressure. As it moves around, it speeds up. The lowest pressure is the top, slows back down, high pressure at the back. And I should say this is an idealized case that we're seeing here, meaning no viscosity, inviscid. Okay. And so again, instead of thinking about pressure, we'd really like to think about a non-dimensional quantity, and that's pressure coefficient. And this is the definition for the pressure coefficient. It's just the difference in my pressure relative to Free or from free stream or some reference pressure, because it's really pressure differences that matter, divided by that dynamic pressure. That's the pressure coefficient. And what we're plotting here is the pressure coefficient as we go from the front to the back of the cylinder, as I move from the front to the back. And this is just in terms of this angle theta. Right? So theta uh, is defined here as zero, and it goes to pi on the back end. So what happens is at the front, the pressure is the highest. It's actually one, the CP is one um, for the cylinder. And uh, I won't show it right here, but we can, uh, maybe I'll show it in a second. We can show this really quickly for an incompressible flow. 
Well, why don't I just go ahead and uh, I'll do that in a second. Sorry. Okay, so the pressure is one up front, the highest pressure. As I work my way around the top, the pressure is dropping. So I'm coming around here as I get to the top. That's going to correspond to this part. And the pressure is actually a minus three right there in the idealized case. So it starts at one, drops down to minus three, comes back up to plus one right here at the back. All right, so I just traverse from front to back, high pressure, low pressure, back to high pressure. Um, and so what you can see, well, just from visualizing the cylinder, it's, it's symmetric, top and bottom. So there's no lift produced. Um, there's also no drag because it's also symmetric front and back. Yeah, and remember this is an idealized case, no viscosity. So what this shows is that there's no drag, okay? But this is not reality. Reality, there's uh, viscosity. So it's gonna look something more like this. What happens is uh, you could think of this as, here, here's an analogy, not perfect one, but think about this as a ball rolling down a hill. If this dashed line that represented my idealized case, no friction, think of this as a gravity with a hill. I have a ball and I push it down the hill and if there's no gravity, it should just make it right back up, just barely, right? Conservation of energy, I should make it back up. But if there was friction, then if I push the ball down the hill, it's uh, losing energy to friction the whole way down and it's not gonna make it all the way back up. So I'm not gonna recover the same high pressure that I had before. So in other words, I had high pressure here, low pressure. I'm not gonna recover all the way to the same high pressure I had before. So the pressure is gonna be a little bit lower. So I've got high pressure up front, not as high pressure below, it's gonna be a bit lower. That means there's gonna be a force pushing backwards and thus drag. And that's essentially what's gonna happen here. As the fluid moves its way from high to low pressure, it's now going from low to high pressure. It's working, the pressure is working against it. We call this an adverse pressure gradient. Uh, as the fluid tries to navigate going from this low to high pressure, at some point it's gonna separate. It doesn't have enough momentum anymore. It's lost too much energy to friction. It doesn't have enough momentum to continue to push against the high pressure and it will leave, separate the body there and will create this wake here. It's gonna start regaining some energy from turbulence as it uh, moves around this wake. But in short, I do not have as high pressure on the back. And so we can see this in this figure here. As I said, it's not a perfect analogy with the ball because it actually changes the shape entirely because of that wake, actually changes the effective shape of the geometry. It no longer looks like a cylinder, so it actually affects the streamlines even up here. So we start from a high pressure, we move down to a low pressure, and I cannot get back to as high of a pressure. I've separated, I'm at a lower pressure than before, and so I now have drag. It's still symmetric top to bottom, so I have no lift, but I do have drag. And notice that I'll have drag from two sources here. One is from pressure, because I now have a pressure imbalance, high pressure up front, low pressure behind. I have a pressure drag, but I've also got a second piece of drag uh, that we kind of implicitly discussed, and that's the skin friction drag. This is that shear stress part. So as the fluid is rubbing against the solid surface, it's transferring momentum between the solid and the fluid. I'm losing energy uh, to shear stress. So the presence of viscosity caused both shear, skin friction drag, so we'll call it shear stress uh, gives way to skin friction drag, and then also this pressure drag where I couldn't recover all the way, the flow separated, I've got a wake, um, an additional pressure drag. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take that exact same picture and just flip it upside down why did I do that? Well, I'll show you in a minute why. Um, we, we basically, well, not basically, we took the exact same data, but instead on this uh, y-axis, we plotted minus CP instead of CP. And that's just convenient for airfoils, as we'll see in a second. So now let's get to an actual airfoil. Here's an airfoil. Um, it's at an angle of attack. Uh, I didn't quite define that before, but let me define it really quick quickly here. So here's an airfoil and here's the free stream velocity and this is my cord line here. This angle here is called alpha and alpha is called the angle of attack. Okay, so this airfoil is at some angle of attack. The free stream is approximately somewhere like this. 
you can see it's accelerating over the airfoil um, and also uh, accelerates a bit over the back, but not as much. There's a stagnation point, dark blue here in the airfoil. So kind of like the cylinder, but it looks quite different. You'll notice on the y-axis here, uh, and this is from a program XFOIL, which we'll use, we're applying the pressure coefficient, but see how the negative ones are on top, just like the last picture that we drew, okay? The reason why we do this is then, let's think about what's happening here on the upper surface first. I come into my stagnation, and in this idealized case, that's still gonna be at a pressure coefficient of one, so it's gonna be here. I'm gonna accelerate around here, so I get the lowest pressure here in white. I've got a really low pressure, and then I come back towards a high pressure. So that corresponds to this upper curve here, right? Stagnation in the front, accelerating rapidly, really close to the leading edge of the airfoil to the lowest pressure here in this white area. And then I start to recover as I come towards back, come back towards the high pressure along the back. This line then corresponds to the lower surface of the airfoil, where again, from stagnation here, pressure increases as I accelerate a bit, but not nearly as much. And then I recover back towards the trailing edge. So the reason why we plotted minus CP is just a convenience. That means that this upper curve corresponds to this upper part of the airfoil and this lower curve corresponds to the lower part of the airfoil. It's a very common way to plot this and it's just, again, convenience. So that upper corresponds to upper and lower to lower. Um, there's several things we can see from this plot. Uh, I'm not going to prove it right here, and it's a little bit approximate, but essentially the area between this curve corresponds to the lift that the airfoil generates. That's not exactly true. It actually corresponds to the normal force, but uh, for a modest angle of attack, it's going to be approximately the lift. So conceptually, what you can think about is that I want to get this big pressure peak here, right? That's going to help me to get more lift. The bigger I can get this suction peak, or the more I can accelerate the flow around here, I'm going to have more area between my curve and more lift. The problem though, the trade-off, right? There's always gonna be trade-offs here uh, in engineering, can't get things for free, is that if I make this peak bigger, I'm, I have to recover from this low pressure, remember this is negative, low pressure to the high pressure at the back end. So that means the whole time I'm moving from this low to the high, the fluid is, needs energy to overcome. It's like, you know, you're running against this, uh, pressure that's pushing against you and that's draining energy. So the longer this is, the steeper this is, the more energy I need to have and the more likely I am to separate. So if I get too high, right, as I increase this angle attack more, what's going to happen is it's going to accelerate further around this peak. I'm going to get a bigger peak, more lift potentially, but I've got a longer pressure recovery I need to traverse against and therefore will probably separate and create a big wake and that's not gonna be desirable. Okay, so there's some trade-offs that are gonna occur here. You can see some statistics here. These are things we've, talk, we've been talking about. Alpha angle of attack, five degrees. It's showing you the lift coefficient, moment coefficient, and this is a parasitic drag coefficient. We'll talk about the different pieces of drag uh, in future time. Okay, so that's it for today. Next time we will get into the second half of our discussion on airfoils and wings.